All right, everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. I see we're still getting folks kind of trickling in as we go. We've got a good number who are in already. Uh, thank you so much for joining us to talk about uh, tracking key performance indicators or KPIs for OER. Um, this is a webinar uh, with uh, the CCC OER uh, group consortium as part of Open Education Global. And as we are a global organization, a national organization, it's always fun to see where you are coming from. So if you wouldn't mind taking a moment, throwing your name, saying hi, and where you're from in the chat, that would be great. So on the agenda today, um, we are just going to do some introductions, uh, look at an overview of some things we're doing. Uh, we'll have a panel, we're going to have a presentations from each of our panelists, and then we'll have a general panel discussion. Um, free to ask questions in the chat, but we'll try to move those questions to the end. Um, and then we'll do a QA and a and, and finish with some upcoming events. So my name is Nathan Smith. I'm an OER coordinator and faculty in residence. I teach philosophy at Houston Community College, and these are our panelists. I'm going to go ahead and uh, reserve introduction for each of them right before they speak, give a little longer uh, introduction to what they do. Um, but it's really nice. We have a very broad range of different folks who are engaged with OER at different levels. And I think um, they'll be able to give us some really concrete um, guidance on sort of what we should be looking for in terms of tracking uh, success metrics in OER and presenting those to our stakeholders. So uh, the CCC OER mission is to expand awareness and access to high quality OER, support faculty choice and development, foster regional OER leadership and improve student equity and success. That's what we're all about. And I hope that today's webinar helps serve each of these goals. As you can see, our membership uh, spans across the United States, um, both continental and including Hawaii. Um, and, uh, and if you are a uh, community college and would be interested in participating in this community of practice, please visit the website cccoer.org slash member and um, become a part of the organization. Uh, we do lots of different activities that connect you to other people doing excellent stuff in OER. Finally, I just wanna let you know about a campaign that's going on that I think is really important and speaks to some of the core values of OER. This is the Free the Textbook campaign. You may know that the publishers and bookstores are promoting a, uh, a textbook saving service that they are using a lot of the same language that we use in OER in terms of saving students money, providing first day access. Um, and, and they're saying that this, this program is really the way to go in the future. It's sometimes called inclusive access. There are proprietary names for that. What we wanna say is, you know, let's not be, let's not rest with, uh, you know, textbook savings or saving students money. Let's get to free, let's get to radically open. Let's literally make, let's really open up the textbook. That's what OER does. It's really a unique thing. So uh, visit this website, freethetextbook.org. Find some material there that you can distribute on your local campus. Maybe you're seeing these programs come in and, um, and I think it's important to know what they really are to read the fine print and then um, to, to, to sort of uh, to understand what students are getting into. Okay, so we're gonna kick off the discussion with Judith Sebesta. She is the executive director of the Digital Higher Education Consortium of Texas or Digitex. And they are a consortium that provides support to community colleges in, textbook, in Texas. Um, importantly, for our purposes, she co-authored a 2019 survey of uh, the use of OER in the state of Texas and what people around Texas are doing. Judith. Thank you, Nathan. I really appreciate that introduction. And I'd like to thank CCC OER for inviting me to share our work here at Digitex. And good afternoon, everybody. So at Digitex, we engage in a variety of initiatives. Historically, we've been focused on interinstitutional course sharing across Texas. But over the past couple of years, we have 
expanded our initiatives to include leading the Texas Quality Matters Consortium and also to support open educational resource adoption, adaptation, and implementation at public Texas community colleges and, of course, beyond. One of the first initiatives in which we engaged under this OER work was to partner, as you can see on the slide, with the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management and Education and the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, our state higher education agency, on a statewide survey on OER policy and practice. We conducted the survey in spring of 2019 and the report came out in the fall of 2019. And when I finish speaking, I'll drop a link to that report into the chat for you so you can go directly to it and see more detail. This was a survey on OER programs, policies and practices at both two and four year public and private nonprofit institutions in Texas. And we garnered responses from 100 institutions painting a picture of really a growing commitment to OER across Texas. Really the, the, the responses that we got were quite exciting for this baseline statewide survey, which is the first that's been done in the state of Texas related to OER policy and programs and practice. Next slide. So questions top, question topics ranged from things like policies, drivers behind OER work, faculty training and incentives, budgets, partnerships, OER course marking, barriers to adoption, and data collection and impact. And for the purposes of this webinar, I will focus briefly on the latter two. So one of the key findings that's pertinent to our subject today from this survey was that data collection on the pedagogical and financial impacts of OER in Texas is nascent yet promising. Approximately 20% of the institutions that responded to the survey said that they are collecting data on the financial or teaching and learning impacts of OER. And these were the KPI, the key program indicators that they were offered to respond to quality of teaching, student academic performance, student persistence in courses or programs, student engagement in courses or materials, availability of high quality materials, cost of course development for the institution and cost of course materials for learners. Next slide. So I just wanted to focus on this slide primarily for today. The, the question that respond that these 20% of the total 100 institutions responded to here was where data are available, please rate whether OER has improved each of the following at your institution. And so you can see here that they responded whether it stayed the same, increased, decreased, or didn't know. And so I think you can just let me just pause here for a bit. You can see, I mean, only 17 respondents. So this is really baseline data for us. We're certainly hoping that in future iterations of the survey, which I'll talk about uh, before I finish, that we will have more um, institutions that can respond to this one. And those that didn't respond, by the way, said that it was, it was really for a variety of reasons, um, that they had not yet collecting the data, data that what the information they had was primarily anecdotal, um, their programs were in their infancy, but they did, many of them did indicate that they were hoping to collect data in the future. The smaller the institution was, the less likely it was that they had engaged in this kind of data collection. You know, obviously the good news is here from this slide that uh, quite a few, uh, the majority indicated that the student cost of course materials did decrease. So that's, uh, that's good news for us. Um, so in conclusion, I just wanted to say that the next iteration of the survey, we hope to start, engage, start uh, conducting in this coming spring. We're having our kickoff meeting next week with our same partners, ISCME and the THECB. And we hope to perhaps include for-profit institutions as well, and maybe ask questions about things like the um, impact of OER course marking, equity question, questions on equity, and the use of our new state repository, OER Techs. Thank you, Nathan. I'll turn it over to Richard. Outstanding. Thanks so much, Judith. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Richard Sebastian. He's the Director of Open and Digital Learning at Achieving the Dream. Um, Achieving the Dream is a large nonprofit that supports a national network of community colleges uh, with some very important goals for student success. He, importantly, Richard has led the Achieving the Dreams OER degree initiative. Um, 
and uh, he's uh, currently monitor managing a follow-up grant project to investigate uh, innovative uses of OER in the college classroom. So thanks so much for joining us, Richard. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. Um, so if you can move to the next slide, uh, Nathan, would be great. So I, you know, my um, my perspective on this is is pretty um, global, at least national, uh, in regards to um, the kind of KPIs that that's that you know uh, can be of value to uh, many different kind of institutions um, in in the U.S. community colleges in this case, um, and the OER degree initiative was really kind of a very large initiative. Um, just to give you some statistics of kind of the final. Um, uh, Kind of data that came in of the really two and a half, three year initiative. Uh, it involved 38 community colleges um, across the US. Uh, close to 2,000 instructors were involved in the, the courses and course sections that were part of this initiative. And there were close to 6,700 uh, course sections created uh, of OER courses uh, involving about 160,000 students. I'm rounding up or down on, on these. Um, and so you can see it's a, a pretty, pretty um, uh, sizable initiative. And it really, um, it's, you know, we're funded by the Hewlett Foundation, among others, um, the Gates Foundation, uh, Syndium. Uh, and it, it really gave us the opportunity to look really broadly at, I guess, what I would frame as institutional kind of scaled OER implementation through this kind of OER degree model. Um, and so we produced out of this uh, two interim reports and, and one final report, and I'll share the link for those um, after, I'm, uh, after I'm done here. Uh, but let me talk a little bit about um, kind of the, the scope of the project and some of the, some of the data that we, uh, we collected. So we, we focused on for the research uh, aspect of the research study of this uh, project, three different areas. So implementation, implementation of these OER degree pathway projects at these 38 colleges. What worked? How did it scale? What were some of the barriers? So um, really kind of on the ground um, uh, data on what it really takes to launch the kind of a scaled institutional OER program. Um, we're also looking at academic impacts, and this is a little different um, than many of the, uh, you know, the OER research has been out this because it was looking at multiple OER courses. So really looking at the progress of students uh, who take more than one, uh, up to four or even beyond uh, OER courses, and did that have uh, any kind of impact uh, academically uh, uh, as they um, you know, had were able to take advantage of, of uh, more than one OER course. So we really looked at it kind of more of a, uh, not really longitudinal, but you know, multiple semesters of data. Um, and I think also a kind of a unique piece of this, uh, of this uh, research and, and the report that emerged from it were the economic impacts, um, really kind of multiple at, um, aspects of really, you know, what does it really cost uh, to, uh, to launch an OER degree uh, and, uh, you know, what are the real costs and what are the real savings to students? Um, so, <clears throat> you know, when I, I know when I was in Virginia running kind of OER programs there, um, I used a hundred dollar. Uh, you know, I didn't have any other data, so I used a hundred dollars for savings, right? So if you counted up the number of students in the course and, you know, who, who used an OER in that course and then, you know, um, uh, you just uh, rounded that $100 to how much they saved. And, and really it's more complex than that. So we really, uh, we worked with um, uh, RPK group to really d dig deep onto the savings part as well as the cost part. So how much is it, you know, if you pay a, a faculty member a stipend of $1,500, for example, to develop an OER course, um, that that's not the measurement really, because they use, they spend much more time. So we had, you know, time logs to, to to kind of record that they use kind of administrative, you know, effluvia and people to support that. So really kind of getting down to really a detailed costs for these, these course emails. And they were hot at the course, you know, even, even for just kind of adopting uh, kind of an OER course, even in a group, um, uh, you know, it was, uh, it, you know, it was pretty steep. So we collected a lot of data, we were able to collect data from site visits, interviews, focus groups, classroom observations in order to kind of produce uh, these, these kind of uh, robust reports. Next slide. 
And, and, and uh, you know, I encourage you to look at the final report that we put out um, uh, and, and other two reports as well. But as you can see, we were able to kind of nail down what were the real cost savings to come up with a model for that for students? What were the real pathway costs over time, right? Over the course of time? And, you know, what do they, um, uh, you know, really cost for uh, colleges to launch? And the effects on credit accumulation. And th there's really good news all around in this report. Um, you know, the scaled OER saves students money, institutions break even or even make money, uh, and students take more courses. Um, that's the, that's the uh, too long, didn't read version. Uh, but I encourage you to, to, to read that. Um, so just a few key takeaways since I'm running out of time. Uh, next slide. Um, you know, really, it's important to think about who you're, who you want to report to at the end of this, of your project, or, you know, in, in midway to say, who's going to continue funding it, or who do you need to persuade, or who's, who's this data going to, uh, you're going to need to, 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 you know, achieve whatever goal you have for that project. So think about the KPIs uh, in that regard. Um, and maybe some less tangible or obvious ones. Um, there's some kind of interesting um, ways of looking at some of this data. So tuition recovery, right? So you, your attrition drops 6%. You have more students finishing a course. What's that? What's the benefit of that, of holding on to that tuition dollars? And, and can you, how can you repurpose that? for example, and just one of many. Um, and, you know, if you can try to kind of be consistent, if you have multiple projects or if you have a multi-year project of doing some kind of long, longer term uh, look at, um, as, you know, uh, completion of courses, maybe even uh, of degrees, because I think that's going to be, that's data that's going to be really important to know. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what I got. Um, and I'll go ahead and stop there. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you so much, Richard. And I'm sure people will really appreciate to see the links to those reports in the comments. Next up, we have uh, Michael Daly, who's the Director of Operations at SUNY OER Services. Um, SUNY OER Services is a big state uh, University of New York's uh, OER project. Um, so in his role, uh, Michael uh, works with campuses and faculty to, to drive adoption. And um, he's also worked on collecting um, data. He's worked with some external partners in OER and RPK group and um, developed sustainability plans. Um, prior to, to joining SUNY OER services, he spent 10 years as the instructional public services librarian at Fulton Montgomery Community College. Um, so uh, I'm gonna turn it over now to uh, Michael Daly, thanks. Thanks, Nathan, and thanks everybody at CCC OER and everybody joining us today. Certainly happy for the invitation to share and learn um, together. Next slide. So I'm going to talk a, back a little bit about uh, the challenges and maybe some of the opportunities that we have found in the State University of New York, New York uh, in particular working with our community colleges. A little background, uh, SUNY is a large comprehensive system. The community colleges are about uh, half, a, half the number of our campuses, so there's 30 community colleges and they make up a little under half of our um, overall enrollments. Um, so they're certainly a crucial element of the State University of New York. So what you're seeing on the screen is a glimpse into the back end course section and student section or population section reporting system known as Cirrus and SUNY. So all campuses automatically report to this system every semester. And as OER courses sections are tagged correctly locally, that information flows into Cirrus. So by design, theoretically, there's a good system in place. However, good data in, good data out. If OER course section isn't tagged or gets mistagged, um, we have potential problems. As you can see, perhaps, also there are any number of combinations of interventions uh, that might compose a student course experience. Those interventions might be federal or state economic programs. So a student could be receiving Pell Grant tuition assistance program, which is a local state of New York um, assistance program. They could be on WIC, the federally funded women, infant, children uh, food program. It could be a first generation college student. Um, and their course experience could also have certain attributes. So they could be involved in a course that has a leadership component to them as in part of an honors college, um, but is also using open educational resources. And so one of the questions we often ask to unpack by administrators, both at the system level and when we work with campus provosts is which matter, and there's any number of elements, I'm only showing you a screenshot, which matter and which matter more. Um, I do wanna make note in Cirrus, there's, there's some critical interventions that either aren't tracked for a very good reason, um, or tracked and not attached to a course report. So those, those might include um, elements such as mental health, our students um, making themselves aware of mental health services, um, food security. Um, every SUNY campus um, 
community college or otherwise, um, by state law, has a food bank or a food bank system. Um, students that utilize that service, you know, aren't tracked uh, appropriately. And how do those interventions impact a student's overall course experience? Um, and here I'm certainly nodding to, I think, the Hope Center's Real College movement and some, some important awareness uh, that they're giving to some of those elements. There's other things that happen locally on campuses, tutoring services, um, room locations, where a room, is, where a room is located on campus. Can students get there efficiently, effectively, either at the start of the day or in between dropping their student off at a day or their children off at a daycare center? Um, so all these things kind of compound or potentially make uh, really getting true impact of OER data um, somewhat challenging. Um, all that to said, I think understanding that there's a lot impacting the lives of our students and OER is certainly one positive intervention. So these challenges should not shy us away from trying to dig into or disaggregating the data. Next slide, Nathan. So you've heard a lot about RPK Group. Um, SUNY was part of the Achieving the Dream uh, OER degree initiative that Richard just talked about. We had five SUNY campuses participate in that. And through that, we got to know RPK Group and some of the people that work at RPK Group and re-engaged their services in the fall of 18 uh, to work closely with our system offices and campuses to construct a framework or an approach to sustaining OER over the long term. So they started with some focus groups in 2018 and we've moved on to sustainability cohorts. So these are groups of 15, 12 to 15 campuses going through a series of 10 in-depth workshops over 18 months where they really internalize and unpack that framework um, and, and recite in fundamental ways in which their local campus culture, resources and infrastructure might inform or aid their OER program. Um, so above all, I think our refrain um, when we work with campuses in, in talking about KPIs, you know, to thine own self culture or to thine own self program campus institution, you know, be true, understand what works for you. Um, one key program indicator or success indicator at one of our community colleges may not be an important one 30 miles down the road and, and making sure that's, that's a clear and apparent is important as all of us begin to think about uh, KPIs for our own efforts. Um, in many ways, the broad and narrow elements of the framework are selected by campuses as their KPIs and some aren't selected. Um, and these choices very often extend to other efforts underway and in the works. Next slide, please. So I think a lesson that we've learned um, over the last three and a half and even longer, because some of our campuses have been in, involved with OER for going on 10 or 12 years now, is that OER doesn't have to be or shouldn't be the thing, right? It can very often be the thing that touches a lot of other things on your campus. And so an emerging successful key performance indicator for a number of our community colleges is the number of other student success initiatives in which OER plays an integral part. So at Rockland Community College, um, we see a college success OER course um, being a part of their realignment with Guided Pathways schools. And so their entire Guided Pathways program shows OER as their college success entry course. Dutchess Community Colleges uses an open math homework system as one element of their placement rubric for math courses. Um, so it's a multiple measure tool. Monroe Community College, I think Michelle is on the call today with us. Um, it just started use, utilizing OER in co-rec math courses or, or math courses where students aren't yet getting co um, college credit. And multiple, multiple community colleges in SUNY are extending their OER efforts to K-12 school districts that are part of concurrent enrollment programs, which is our, a large percentage of enrollment for many of our community colleges. Certainly willing to share more information, but I just wanna give a glimpse into one key program indicator um, which isn't necessarily guided by student success, but on a programmatic level, which is touching other things. That's great. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, so our last uh, speaker today, and again, we're gonna be able to take a bunch of questions and do a little bit of panel discussion afterwards, but this is uh, Mike Mills, who is the uh, Vice President of the Office of E-Learning Innovation and Teaching Excellence at Montgomery College. He oversees MC Open, which is the OER and free textbook program uh, at the college. Um, they were also a recipient of the uh, Achieving the Dream OER degree grant. And I should mention that Mike Mills is a uh, current uh, executive committee member, council member of our of CCC OER. So thank you for joining us, Mike, and uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Nathan. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about what we do at Montgomery College and the KPIs we look at. And um, it's a joy to see so many friends uh, joining us today. So if you'll um, just get, 
Go to, yeah, that, that's, that's mine. Uh, Montgomery College is a two-year school in Montgomery County, Maryland, three campuses. We're, we're rather large. And um, we've been doing some OER work prior to 2017. Um, maybe we started 2013, 2014, but we had absolutely no way of capturing the data that uh, we, we thought we, we knew what was going on, but we were having to individually ask faculty members, how were you using OER, the number of students who were benefiting, until we were able to be part of the ATD OER grant that helped jumpstart our OER efforts because we had to tag our courses. And so beginning in 2017, we had a firm understanding of the impact we were having. And you can see through this slide that um, the enrollments have increased every year. And if we use Richard's uh, generally accepted number of $100, and that's what we use at Montgomery College simply because it's, it's easy to use, uh, we've estimated about $6 million in savings since uh, we were able to start calculating the numbers. Uh, of students enrolled. If you'll go to the, the next slide, please. Um, and the, along with the enrollments, the, the growth has been evident in the number of sections that we've offered. So this fall semester, we're uh, just north of 500 sections and it keeps growing. And it keeps growing because the students are, are demanding that it grows. So, you know, one of the key performance indicators that uh, we track is is this growth, um, and it's because of the the student demand. We have students talking to faculty members about wanting to use OER. Uh, we have students who are questioning why they have to pay three hundred dollars for a textbook, and their friend who's taken the same course, different section, doesn't have to pay anything because the faculty member is using OER. So we we don't mandate. OER at Montgomery College, um, and quite frankly, we haven't had to because the students are, are helping to do our bidding for us, and, and that's been a, a really big benefit for us. Um, if you'll go to the next slide. And the, the savings are great, and students tend to focus on the amount of money that they save. Uh, it's still a, a key factor for them. They want to know whether they have to pay $300 for a textbook. But when we started working with faculty and really selling the benefits of OER to faculty and administrators, we had to drill down to the success. And when we started collecting the data, our goal was to not do any harm to students. If we could save them a hundred, hundreds of dollars in textbook costs and provide the same quality of education then it was a win. And so we've been collecting data, uh, student success data since 2017. And without fail, the success is, is comparable or better in every uh, demographic. So we, we break down by gender and by ethnicity. And you can see just a, a couple of the past semesters here. Uh, the spring 2020 is an anomaly in so many ways uh, because of COVID. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't spend a whole lot of time analyzing the spring 2020 data, uh, but prior to 2020, it, it's been very comparable and I'll be happy to share more about that. Uh, next slide, please. So Richard had talked a little bit about return on investment and we too were part of the RPK study. And when you looked at, at what our students have been doing as a result of our OER work. Um, if they're involved taking three or more OER courses, uh, they took almost six more credits than students taking no OER courses. And that does a couple of things. One, it, it speeds up their time to completion and ultimately benefits the economic uh, stability of Montgomery County because they're able to take that money and reinvest it in either education or other aspects of, of county life. And then from the, the college standpoint, our ROI was 
just over a half a million dollars. And once our senior administrators saw that, it was an easy sell to continue the, the program of, of OER. Uh, so we, you know, we have continued our, our work. I'll be happy to talk more about it. Uh, we've moved on to a lot of open pedagogy aspects of OER at this point, uh, primarily focusing on social and global justice. So with that, Nathan, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thanks so much. Y'all, this is great uh, start to the discussion and I, I really thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Um, so I'm definitely watching the chat and would be happy to throw questions you all have to the panel. I have a few questions that just to get us kicked off. Um, so one of the things that, um, that came up um, in a couple of the conversation in a couple of the presentations is this issue of course tagging and collecting data, you know, good data in, good data out. Sort of, um, I wonder if you, you could talk a little bit more about that. And Judith, I know you, you raised this as a, an issue in our earlier conversation. So I'll just, I'll kick this question to you if you wouldn't mind. What's, what's going on with the course tagging or what, what should we be thinking about there? Well, I appreciate that, Nathan. It is a subject I'm very passionate about. Um, and we did have one question in our survey about that. I can come back to that in just a second briefly. But I think, you know, what Michael Daly talked about uh, in terms of their work in SUNY, it's, it's a perfect example of the advantages of engaging in course tagging, or as we call it in Texas, course marking, because of the kind of data that you can collect whenever you're marking the courses that utilize OER. And I think I probably don't, you know, I'm preaching to the converted if I talk about the advantages to students of that kind of discoverability. Um, but I, Texas, back in 2017, our governor, uh, Greg Abbott, did sign into law H, uh, a Senate Bill 810, which uh, requires that Texas higher education institutions share searchable information with students on OER. The wording is specifically open educational resources and that's defined largely using the five R's um, that we all know about. But our survey revealed that of the 100 institutions that did respond, 61% have course markers in place. Not all of those though are using the term OER. They're using a variety of terms from free to uh, affordable, um, and a couple of others. Uh, Texas does not um, mandate compliance. So while, while they mandate that you mark your courses, there is no one tracking compliance for Texas institutions. And I, uh, you know, I think what our survey is revealing that not everyone is complying, it's for a variety of reasons. And we shouldn't necessarily blame the institutions for that because I think those of us who have engaged in that know it can be, can be quite complicated. But I think what I wanna say here for the purposes of this is that we, I, we need to start working on collecting robust data on course marking from whether or not institutions are doing it, are complying, but also what is its efficacy, both for students, for the colleges, for faculty members? What are the challenges? What are the barriers? Uh, I think that, that there's a lot of robust data to be, com to be collected. And, and as I mentioned, we're hoping that we might be able to build a little bit more of that into this next survey uh, now that our colleges have had some time to work on implementing that um, on their campuses. Thanks, Judith. Nathan, can I yeah. jump in and, and piggyback on something Judith mentioned about the, the terminology used in the, the tagging? Because when we first started talking about tagging courses at Montgomery College, we, we first used OER. And then what we realized was, and this, this was again, 2016, 2017, was that students may not know when they go to search for classes what OER meant. And so we, we changed our terminology to Z course for, for you know, zero textbook cost. Um, but it, it, it was interesting to see how students responded. Now, you know, today OER is more prevalent, the term is more prevalent, and they may respond to that a little uh, better than they would have, you know, five years ago. That's a great point. Anybody else have something to add on this? There was a question just to stay with uh, Mike Mills for a second uh, for in the chat about how it is that you collect data on enrollment and um, for your uh, your MC open classes. Who do you work with on campus to, to do that specifically? 
we we had a report written by our IT staff uh, that my assistant can can run, and because the the courses are tagged, they're coded. Uh, it's easy for her to count up the number of of courses that we're offering, and then from the student success standpoint, we take those courses and create a report in Blackboard Analytics and crosswalk that um, to get the gender and ethnicity breakdown. That's excellent. And then, uh, Michael Daly, do, you talked a little bit about the, the central system you use, but can you describe sort of which departments are involved in that process and what tools you use? Yeah, but you're gonna to have to buy me a beer, Nathan, because it's gonna take a while. Um, so it really it really varies locally. So we um, and it, it depends on the size of the campus and, and kind of the local structures in place. Sometimes it's an IR office, as Mike Mills just mentioned. Sometimes it's the registrar. Um, some of our larger campuses, um, academic deans of schools have that responsibility to make sure it's tagged before it goes to the registrar, before it goes to IR. Um, so through our sustainability work, work with RPK Group, we're really trying to broaden the understanding that reach is absolutely necessary when working with an OER program, that it can't just be one person kind of, you know, championing OER, that you're going to have to have a, a, a robust awareness across campus of what needs to happen to put in accurate measures um, to, to, have this, to have this happen. Um, and by and large, I would say, you know, 99% of our campuses want to do this well. Um, they, they're really eager to do it well. It just... It, we're at a point where scale is absolutely um, becoming a problem with doing this accurately in SUNY. Um, you know, we have hundred thousand, hundreds of thousands of students every year that are coded as OER in, in Cirrus, tens of thousands of sections, um, and we know, and we know that we're missing sections and students, and we also know that the reports that we're getting are inaccurate reports. Um, to me, uh, I struggle with why why it can't happen if we can accurately code online courses in modality. Um, can we just look at OER or affordability or cost structures as a modality and kind of ingrain that into cultures um, to make these kind of tagging processes happen more regularly? Outstanding. Thanks a lot. Um, I wanted to turn the next question specifically because you mentioned, we've mentioned a couple of times this RPK group and mm -hmm. the studies they've done and uh, return on investment. And, and maybe uh, Richard, you could start us off here. Um, can you describe like a little bit in a little more detail, like exactly what is being collected? Like what are the, what are the inputs in that, that you have that we should be thinking about when we're looking at a return on investment um, study and, and, and maybe walk us through a little bit of, of what that looks like on a campus? Yeah, so um, it's it's pretty it's pretty complex, but uh, there's a couple areas to it. So the so think about student savings, right? Um, what RPK Group did were collect um, uh, some external data on it to really develop a um, kind of uh, kind of uh, levels of use that students uh, or purchase levels for for students. So you know, students don't all go out and buy brand new books, right? They don't all buy from the bookstore. Some rent, some don't. You get it all. So they use some some external data to develop a kind of uh, a scenario of percentages of you know how st you know students buying patterns and use that to um, and the the textbook the textbook costs to actually come up with a more precise number. So on that slide, you know they had a range like if you use the kind of traditional kind of calculations, I think there is savings of um, something like one hundred twelve dollars. Uh, for for that, but if you look at the kind of the the actual buying patterns of students, the the state savings per textbook or per you know per student is is probably more realistically around sixty six sixty eight dollars somewhere in you know eighty dollars in that range. Um, so that's how they kind of uh, worked with the kind of student uh, textbook purchases for for institutional um, costs around OER. They were, um, you know, they had uh, these pretty detailed time logs. So if you were, you know, part of this, you're a faculty member developing a course, even collaboratively, you kept kind of detailed time logs of when you were working on OER and where and kind of what resources that you were using. Uh, and, they, and then they calculated, you know, from faculty salaries and from administrative budgets, like what that cost actually is going to be. Uh, so they came up with kind of an initial um, snapshot of, 
let's call them, uh, you know, develop, developmental costs for, for OER. And as I said, you know, it was pretty steep. Um, it, was, it, was, it was actually kind of dispiriting when we first saw the numbers, because it was like, well, this is, you know, this is super expensive for, for the institutions. But, but then, you know, uh, over the course of the study, obviously, they also took in the uh, expanding course sections. Uh, so as we saw some really super successful expansion uh, of courses within multiple sections and then kind of growing into additional courses, uh, you see that um, cost, you know, if you, you, you continue that cost, you know, per over a, a couple semesters, it dropped significantly down to, it went from a couple hundred dollars to like $21 per course, right? Uh, and then they then they added in like well in these these uh, uh, increased course enrollments and what does that so how does that take away from the the uh, the overall cost from you know from the um, from the development of this so those were a couple of the elements for for um, kind of coming up with these calculations but it was you know it was really kind of some detailed um, cost and revenue data from from each of the colleges and they put that together to come up with their you know over the course over kind of a time timeline. That's great. So, so the so the lessons I'm hearing is that over time the cost per course gets cheaper. Yep. And then in addition, as more students take OER courses, enrollment increases, and I suspect retention increases, or at least the the number of courses that students taking these OER courses, the number of courses that they take in a semester actually increases, which which is increasing revenue into the institution. Yeah, so so looking at the, let's call them non-OER students and OER students, you know, traditional OER students uh, took additional credits, um, uh, different kind of uh, statistically different at different institutions, but overall it showed a kind of increase, overall increase in uh, course credits earned. Um, and so that's, that's there's a, there's a dollar amount to that, right? Um, at, at, a, at a college for um, having a student take additional credits. Um, so, yeah. Outstanding. And Mike Mills, is this something you track at your institution, the um, enrollment intensity or the, the sort of number of credit hours that a student taking OER uh, takes on a semester basis? Well, we, we, I'll tell you, it's not easy to track and, and, you know, RPK did a, a wonderful job of, of doing that. It, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, we're looking at that, but it's, it's not, not easy data to, to collect. And, um, you know, I think it's something that we should all probably want to take a, a closer look at. Um, I will tell you that in looking at data from a couple of years ago, and I shared student success data, um, two, two years ago, we had the highest graduating class um, of Hispanic students that we've ever had at Montgomery College. And I don't think it's coincidence that when you look at their OER uh, success, the, um, that Latin uh, X population does really well with OER. And so your decrease in time to degree um, completion because students are able to pump money back into their education. Um, but it, to answer your question, Nathan, we're not collecting it as, as well and following as well as we should. That's great. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is a, this is a challenge. I think it's a great metric, um, but it, it, it's hard to track. Um, uh, so somebody was asking in the chat what enrollment intensity mean, and I just it's, it refers to the, the number of credits the student takes in a semester and, and what uh, RPK group found. And then another study that did that looked at, um, uh, um, at uh, sorry, um, Tidewater Community College found also that, that enrollment intensity increases when a student takes an OER. And, um, and that suggests that, that maybe there's a return there. One thing I wanted to turn to maybe um, Michael Daly I would, and um, Judith, if you could touch on this. Um, I really like Mike Mills uh, data on disaggregating by ethnicity. And you know, one of the things that we, we know with OER, we, we want with OER is to address the equity issues in education. And so, and I really like the way um, 
uh, Michael Daly noted like all of these different ways of equity, like all of these different parameters. I wonder, Judith, is, are, is anybody in Texas doing stuff that is uh, trying to disaggregate the data on that level to, to look at, are we having an equity impact? That's a good question, Nathan. I, I'm Certainly there are. Off the top of my head, I really am not aware specifically. Um, I, I can say that, uh, I'll brag on her a bit, my our, our DigiTexas Associate Director Ursula Pike is in the current cohort of the Spark Open Leadership Fellowship. And her capstone project that she is going to be working on very soon is on issues of equity. And I know she's also participating in CCC OER's um, executive committee equity group. Luna, you probably need to put that in the chat exactly what that's called. Um, but uh, oh, AC, Gay Lynn says that at Austin Community College, they just aggregate their data. Um, we've seen some impact that supports more equitable outcomes. So I assume that that's going on across the state, but off the top of my head, I don't have examples for you, Nathan. I will say that in terms of the study that we did, the survey that we did, what we did see in, on, on a number of the questions was that there was a desire to, to collect the kind of data or be able to respond to the questions we were asking, but if they were a small college, and that, that probably was often a, a small community college, they didn't have the resources to do what we were asking or um, to engage in that kind of work at their campus. So I think that's, that's an equity issue in a way, I would say. Excellent point. Yeah, that's a really interesting thing. Michael, did you want to, how do you disaggregate the data on some of those thornier issues you were mentioning? Yeah, we, we, we're actually, we talk about key performance indicators. That's, that's one of the charges from our, our SUNY provost, so the provost that kind of oversees all the provosts in SUNY. He's very interested in uh, understanding the impact that the use of OER or affordable materials um, can have of, of students of need, uh, define need broadly, uh, whether that's Pell eligible, students actually receiving Pell, um, students of uh, you know, various ethnicities, um, even down to gender. Um, so that's something we're, we're working hard on. It kind of goes to the can we get the best data most often? Um, you know, we, we, we lead with the assumption that yes, it's gonna have a, a positive impact on those students and we can make learning resources more available um, at, at a lower cost and that, that's going to be a benefit. Um, we just haven't uh, been able to kind of disaggregate the data to a level that we're comfortable yet, uh, but it's certainly within the realm of possibility. And yeah, another thing excellent. we look out too, um, and one thing I should mention, we, know, we don't get any faculty data in SUNY, uh, which, which it's con confounds the problem. Um, I think it would be really interesting if we could get faculty to opt into a participatory study where we could understand the diversity of, of faculty teaching with open educational resources. Um, we know in SUNY that we lack uh, a diverse faculty that you know matches that of our student population. That's something we're working hard to address. Um, but if, you know, if, if it's not a one-to-one, -one, if you don't have a diverse faculty teaching diverse students using open educational resources, um, you have a much larger problem than tagging OER courses. Hey, hey Nathan, I think it's important to, to, to see um, uh, kind of OER use, especially now we, that we know more about kind of its impact on students as a, a tool for closing equity gaps, right? And, and that's a, you know, that was something that you know, we we recommended at the beginning of the OER degree initiative, but it was just a, it was too challenging really for for colleges at the time. But really, can you can you you know hold you know some seats or make sure that the students who really need these you know need this break on uh, textbook costs can get a seat in those courses? Because what we know is that if it's word of mouth, there's just a couple of sections. You know, the you know the students. Um, who need it don't necessarily get get into those courses. So so being more intentional about that and and really thinking about how you can actually uh, more directly um, uh, make sure that those students benefit is 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 another you know I think uh, challenge for colleges to to help close those equity gaps. You know, Nathan, I'll I'll say one more thing. In Texas, we've been very, very fortunate that our legislature over the past couple of sessions, our, our sessions happen every two years in the biennium, that they've really been um, interested in supporting OER and providing resources to to help uh, promote OER practice. Of course, I, what that what that is going to mean is that I think Texas institutions are going to get need to get better 
um, in the way that I think Austin Community College already is, perhaps partly because of their work in the Achieving the Dream initiative. They're going to have to get better at collecting the kind of data that the legislature is going to want to see um, regarding the impact of OER. So I suspect Texas probably is not um, the only one in that respect, but that's, I think that's what's going to need to happen if we're hoping that the legislature will continue to support OER at the level or maybe an increased level that they have. That's a great point. I did want to, I, I, I want, it reminds me of something I wanted to hit on as well, but I, I want to go to a question that Galen asks in the chat. And, and that has to do with, um, you know, when we look at student success, you know, we have the issue of students, who, which students are we talking about, which is what Richard brought up, you know, we want to try to target the students that are most at need and that can be challenging. But then we also have this issue of like, well, which faculty are self-selecting to participate in OER? And, you know, are some of the success metrics just a, a virtue of like sort of really engaged faculty who care about students doing good teaching, you know, in the OER program? It, I, this can be really difficult. I know, um, I, um, and you can do it in a, in a kind of confined study where you look at before and after um, if, of where you look at, you know, Student, student success prior to adopting OER and then student success after adopting OER in the same faculty member. You can control for faculty effects, but what can we do at an institutional level to do this? Or is, it, is this just gonna be something we have to live with? Nathan, at, at Montgomery College, um, you know, we certainly have not mandated that anybody use OER, um, but a number of disciplines have decided on their own that all faculty teaching a specific course would use OER. So we, we, we try to account for those differences that way. And it's, it's been successful. Um, for example, we have in our economics department, uh, all of the faculty chose to use OER for Econ um, 101. And then one faculty member, it, it just wasn't working for that one person. So that faculty member opted out. Uh, but you know, if you can get disciplines to adopt OER, uh, you can negate some of those concerns, I think. And also, how, how, many, how many contingent and or adjunct faculty are being left out of the ability to participate in this movement because it's not valued for them in terms of their uh, you know, um, compensation in terms of their, the, their time. I mean, they would value it, but if an institution does it for them, that, that concerns me as well, because we very well know, it, particularly at community colleges, how many adjunct faculty uh, teach students. So I just, I, I really, really am concerned about the number of faculty that might want to participate in this that can't. A great point, great point. Another equity issue for sure. Um, so we are kind of coming to the end of time. I wanted to point out, just kind of lift up a, a comment thread that was happened in the chat where Ellen, Ellen Range asked a question about those small colleges that have limited resources. And then Michael Daly re replied with, I think, really helpful, you know, just start small with the program you have and then build on the results you get there. Um, maybe just one final word from folks. We've got about two or three minutes. If, Maybe each person could just say one final thought, kind of like, what do you think is the biggest impact thing that you have shown your administrators or stakeholders or funders that, that has kind of kind of sold the OER program at your institution? Sorry, I'm gonna have to call on somebody, aren't I? Okay, Judith, why don't you go first? Are, which one do you see in, in, in Texas institutions that you think like is, is, is probably the, the most salient? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I think that the, the grant programs, our statewide grant programs, we now have two, are, I think are going a long way towards assisting faculty and colleges in implementing OER. I'm and sure what, cool. yeah, what do you think the legislators want to know um, about those programs? What do you think is the, their key concern? Affordability. Okay, great. Thanks. Michael Daly. Yeah, I would say, you know, we're also legislatively funded in, in New York State, SUNY and CUNY. Um, the first question for legislators is affordability. How much money did students save? Um, 
On the ground, I think the biggest win has been working with faculty to let them understand that OER is another choice in the portfolio of choices that they already had. And it's a choice that if you know chosen correctly, provides them an awful lot of flexibility and more academic freedom than maybe they've ever had before. And that's been a real win for us. Awesome. So echoing what Jessica Egan says in the chat, remix. Mike Mills, what do you what do you think? What's the big ticket item? Um, for external stakeholders, i.e. Um, funders, it's the student savings and the equity part. Internally, it's the academic success uh, that we're, we're not harming students by, by using OER. Outstanding. And, and Richard? Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think the OER degree initiative sh gives you gives people give people at colleges a range of of different pieces of evidence. Depending uh, that could that could be useful for a lot of different stakeholders. It shows that yes, you can uh, students will save money uh, through OER programs. Uh, that institutions can invest in a scaled OER program over multiple years and see a return on investment, uh, similar to maybe not similar exactly to Montgomery, but you know, either break even or, um, uh, or um, you know, actually make money and that students take more courses um, and assuming that they may even complete more quickly. And so you'll see kind of a, an increased completion rates. That wasn't part of our study, but so I think it's a win, win, win. Um, and, and that, um, that hopefully the report will be, will be helpful in, in making that argument uh, for, for folks at community colleges who want to support their OER programs. Outstanding. Thanks y'all so much. I think we've fielded a bunch of questions. Um, so uh, as always, uh, these webinars are free to the public and they are available Recordings are available on the CCC OER website, cccoer.org slash webinar. Uh, we had four um, webinars this, um, this semester, so you can see what is going on there. And we are building our schedule for the spring in the next week. And so look for the spring schedule to be coming out uh, soon. Um, thanks, Liz just shared the link in the chat. Um, stay in the loop, get involved, join our very active email listserv, just loads of helpful information gets shared there. It gets archived and put on the web as well. So um, if you have questions about, you know, do you have an OER in this or what do you guys do? What do you all do over here? You know, yeah, that's the sort of thing that uh, this community really is uh, beneficial at. And definitely check out our equity, diversity and inclusion um, a blog series on the website. I think, you know, we, we, we believe equity is a, a, a critical issue in education and we believe OER can address it, but I think we need to be intentional about how we, how we do that. So please check out the blog posts and student impact stories. Um, and well, we will be back in February 2020, you've got the list of contacts here, our presidents, Lisa Young and Sue Tashin, as well as our, um, our, our stalwart uh, administrators, Uni, Una Daly and Liz Yada. Um, so please- Hey Nathan, I don't think anybody yes, wants to relive 2020. Uh, so you, you mean 2021, right? I'm Excellent, this is like- <laughs> We're gonna be done with 2020. <laughs> Please say it's not like Groundhog Year. <laughs> oh my, February, 2021, excellent. Thank you so much. Okay.